Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the state has a new child welfare agency. We'll have the details. We'll also handicap upcoming state elections now that the filing deadline for candidates is passed. And we'll see how a local artist is setting words in concrete. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A special legislative session to overhaul Arizona's child safety and welfare system wrapped up today with the creation of a new agency. Here with the details is Jim Small of the Arizona Capital Times. Jim, good to see you. Let's, uh, let's get what happened today. Well, basically today the legislature gave final approval to this, this pa reform package and funding package for the new Department of Child Safety. Uh, the, the, uh, the Senate had done some work yesterday, a little bit of floor, floor action yesterday, but today was the final vote in the Senate and then the House debated the bill and also voted on it today. And this afternoon, about two hours after the session ended and, and the lawmakers called it quits, the governor signed the bill, and so everything is now in place for the new the new agency to basically replace the old Child Protective Services. And the new agency will be called? The Department of Ch Child Safety. DCS. DCS. And who will be in charge? Uh, Charles Flanagan, who uh, was the former uh, director of the, the Juvenile Corrections Department. Uh, he had been tapped, uh, actually, by, by Governor Brewer back when she first announced it, back in January, when she announced that she was going to spin off this the CPS agency into into a, a new division at the time a new division within the Department of Economic Security, and she called for this new agency to be created. She selected him to lead that new division, and uh, you know he comes from from kind of a corrections background. He was a you know a, a warden and and moved into the administration at the Department of Corrections before going over to juvenile corrections. Uh, but but you know I think he's got a background. His background may be that, but his, his approach to things, uh, you know, I, I think he really won over a lot of a lot of skeptics in, in, throughout this process. Uh, you know that that he's committed to doing what needs to be done and and not simply treating things like as though they're a punishment. It, it, not, not too much enforcement, in other words. Yeah, I mean enforcement's definitely a part of it. I mean that was you know one of the things that the legislature had enacted actually last year, and and, and in fact it was that enforcement wing, uh, the OCWI, that had found. It had come across these mm -hmm. these NI these not investigated cases, and actually, it was the the head of of that that de department that division that reported this to the governor's office. Uh, you know, after after he felt that he wasn't getting any good response from DES director Clarence Carter. All right, um, oversight for this new agency. What do we got? Yeah, we got. You know, a bunch of different oversight. You know, one one thing that, that they did is they uh, continued. There's a legislative oversight panel. Uh, they they expanded, kind of expanded their their scope and their their role in this. There's a, a, a citizens oversight panel uh, that will will basically keep keep an eye on what's going on over there. Uh, you know, it's it's made up of, of folks from state government, folks from outside state government. You know, with the idea of providing a little bit more transparency and accountability to to monitoring what CPS is doing and try to take them out of the shadows a little bit, which has always been a complaint about the old the old agency. Sounds like internal and external audits going on here. Yeah, I, there's, there's definitely going to be uh, you know a, a lot of you know checking up and keeping tabs on what they're doing, especially when it, when it relates to the the backlog of cases that they have. You know, in terms of these this almost fifteen thousand cases that have been inactive for more than sixty days. Uh, you know, as as these caseworkers have struggled to go back through these 6,500 cases that were yes. discovered in the fall, uh, you know, you, you necessarily kind of divert your resources from the incoming cases. And, and right now they're getting 940, more than 940 complaint calls a week mm. into the system. So, you know, you're, you're, it's bailing water out, out of a boat with a teaspoon a, a little bit. And, and so the, they're going to, you know, some of these, these audits and, and these, these, this monitoring is going to really work to make sure that they're keeping on pace both with the incoming cases but also with with whittling down that backlog. You mentioned the backlog and, and, and being in that uh, leaky boat there. Budget, $60 million, what's that, like 55 for next year and five to close out this year? Somewhere? Yeah, five, five for the current year and, and, and almost 55 for the upcoming year. Uh, you know, a, a lot of that is aimed at, in fact, getting rid of this backlog. It, it's aimed at, you know, hiring new staff, to bringing them in, getting them trained, and then also paying for overtime for the, the new and existing staff to really start to cut into that 15,000 case backlog. How much debate was there on the budget, per se, and, and, and especially the idea of benchmarks 
to, to allow for the budget to continue? Because I know that there was some talk regarding benchmarks. It doesn't sound like it went too far. No, it, it, it didn't. You know, yesterday there was a lot of discussion about it in the Senate. There was an amendment that was offered. Uh, it was supported by, uh, offered by Senator Kelly Ward, uh, a Republican from Lake Havasu City, and it was, you know, supported by Senate President Andy Biggs and, and other fiscal conservatives who, who said that, you know, look, we, we don't want to just keep throwing money at this problem. We've thrown more than $250 million at this over the last several years, and we haven't really seen any results. We want to tie We'll give them the first half of the funding, but we want to tie the second half of the funding, make it conditional on them hitting certain goals, on them, you know, knocking down the backlog to a certain point, or getting staffing levels to a certain point, or retention, or or whatever those benchmarks would have been. And the governor's office said that that was a non-starter; they weren't going to go for it. Uh, the, the amendment was ultimately defeated by the Senate yesterday. In, in the House today, there, a similar amendment was drawn up, and it was offered on the floor. And there was, a, you know, kind of a, a quick uh, a statement about why. You know, it's fiscally prudent to do mm -hmm. this kind of thing, but then the amendment was withdrawn. It was never actually voted on. Uh, I think recognizing that, well, first of all, the Senate hadn't done it yet, and 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 second, you know, that the governor viewed that as a poison pill and would have rejected the bill and, and told them to start all over again. And I know that if an effort to put $3 million, additional $3 million in there for uh, preventative services and stuff, uh, that didn't make it as well. So you, so you got the budget there. Uh, you got the guy in place. You got the name for the agency. When, uh, when do they open the doors and what's the first order of business? Well, they are, uh, I mean, effective immediately. The, the, the bills had an emergency clause on them, which meant as soon as the governor signed them, you know, a little bit after two o'clock this afternoon, the Department of Child Safety was officially the new state agency and, and Charles Flanagan was officially the director of it and, and that money goes into effect basically right away. So I think their first order of business is, you know, trying to just formalize that transition, that, that final break and separation from the Department of Economic Security and, and you know, it, for, for a lot of people it's, you know, it, it'll probably be somewhat business as usual as they continue to plow through these backlog cases and, and deal with the new cases that are coming in and at the, at the administrative level it's just to tr make sure that that transition is as smooth as possible and, and, you know, while at the same time trying to keep track, keep, keep, keep on track with everything else they're doing. You mentioned the first order of business. What is the first order of tinkering next session from the legislature? Well, you know, it, it, we don't know that yet. But, it, it, you know, the other thing I think that, that we have to keep in mind is it's not just the legislature. We're going to have a new governor next year. You know, and, and we don't really know, you know, what whoever the new governor is going to be. I mean, there's eight candidates, I think, that are, that are in, the, in the running for it. So we don't know what they're going to want to do. And, and, you know, that was one concern, in fact, from some legislators was, all right, we're, going, we're doing this whole thing. We're making all these changes. We may just come back here next year and have to do a lot of this over again, or, or or redo pieces of it that the new governor doesn't like, or or add pieces onto it that they want to see, you know, in addition to what's already there. So, last question here uh, for those watching or saying this is all fine and dandy, but what changes will things get better? What tangibly changes here? I, I think what tangibly changes is you you've taken this this agency that was a a one piece a, a large piece but but one piece of a much larger state agency and and you've pulled it out and, and you've you've kind of separated it off which allows for a little bit more just scrutiny because it's not wrapped up and it's it's not one one piece of a of a piece of pizza it's it's kind of its own thing now and and so on top of that you've got a, a new director who who seems you know again you know he won over a lot of skeptics and and he seems committed to getting this done and changing the culture the institutional culture i think that's really the big thing that everyone's waiting to see is what's going to happen with that are they going to make those fundamental shifts in in attitudes towards privacy and towards secrecy and towards a lack of transparency or is this going to be business as usual I, I think if it's business as usual you're going to have a lot of very unhappy legislators, and, the, and not to mention the public. Yeah, let the tinkering begin come next session. Definitely. Jim, great stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us.
Yesterday was the filing deadline for Arizona candidates to turn in their signatures, and that means today the field is set statewide, legislative and congressional races. Political consultant Stan Barnes and Bob Grossfeld are here to discuss the upcoming campaign. It's good to see you both here. Good to it's be that here. time a of pleasure. year uh, again, or time of season. I, uh, let's start with just uh, the 30,000 foot view here. It, uh, are we going to see some surprises? Yeah, I, I mean, Bob and I, other few nerds watching this program, we love this kind of, of thing. You know, this is Christmas in the summertime. Um, there's something like uh, 70 people running for uh, the House or the Senate and 130 running for the House. And so we're, we're going to see new personalities. We're going to see missteps. We're going to see smear attack ads. We're going to see bare knuckle. We're going to see some belly flops. We're going to see some people raise a lot of money. We're, see, we're going to see people raise no money. It's going to be a very interesting thing. There's a long way to go between here and the primary and then the general. Are you going to, are you thinking we'll see some surprises uh, come November? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the issue right now is, is who and yes. what. Uh, the one I'm looking at, I mean, I think everybody's looking at is the Republican gubernatorial primary. I mean, you've got, you've got seven people there. Somebody's going to win this thing with 30% of the vote impact of having that kind of a crowd in there? I mean, could you have a dark horse uh, come out of that? Or could the dark horse just simply impact the other races? I think there'll, there'll be some impact. Uh, who's who's going to steal votes from whom? But just at a minimum, I mean, somebody can pick up 10% of the votes just by breathing. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's a lot of analogy to the national presidential race in 2016 and the Arizona gubernatorial race of 2014. Uh, in, in, on the national scene, we have Hillary and all things Hillary and the Democratic side, and then we have a, a plethora of Republican governors and, and U.S. senators gonna run for president. In Arizona, Fred Duvall is the lone Democrat and he's united his party. And then there are seven real candidates who all over the spectrum, all over the money spectrum, all over the philosophical spectrum, and, and all over the personality spectrum. It's going to be very interesting. Does that help or hurt Duval? No, it, it, he loves it. This is how Janet Napolitano got to be governor in 2002. Mm -hmm. This is the Democratic playbook. When, you're in, when you've got fewer registrants than the other party, you hope that the other party has its own civil war, and Republicans are in the midst of a civil war, and some of that's going to come out in the primary. You agree with that? Do you think it's a good, I mean, because people still don't know who Fred Duvall is. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I get your answer is in your smile, I guess, there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, look, Fred now has an opportunity to go around and run the campaign he wants to run without having to think a whole lot about what a, a you know, November opponent's going to say within, within reason. And he's doing that. He's been uh, incredibly successful so far, much more successful than I think I think uh, most people would assume somebody without a primary would, would have. He's running, and he's running very hard. All right, uh, we've got to get to the attorney general's race here. Um, will the incumbent get out of the primary? That is the uh, echo chamber conversation being had in all hallways of the Capitol um, today. Uh, certain lawmakers, Republican lawmakers, came out and asked him to resign. They're following a trail of U.S. senators and Congressman Salmon. Um, the, I think the answer is probably no. He seems to have what I describe as a Churchillian manner of sticking with it and never giving up. You can give him that credit. He's not giving up. However, uh, a great many Republican thinkers, myself included, believe that if he's the nominee, he cannot win the general election. And so as long as he's in the race, all he's doing is hurting the Republicans. Is he hurting the Republican Party? Is he hurting other candidates? He's, yes, 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 and yes. If he happens to survive the primary, then whoever wins the primary for governor and for other offices, they have to campaign together, and they'll be explaining him wherever yeah. they go, and that's not a good uh, scene. Felicia Rodolini, Democrat, you're smiling again over here. We, we got the first two, two, two smiles of the evening. But again, <laughs> Rodolini, can she beat a Brnovich? Can she beat a Horn? Well, she definitely can beat a Horn. Uh, Brunovich is, is an unwritten script so far. Uh, nobody knows much about him. He hasn't been campaigning that anybody I know can see. And uh, unless he's raising money very quietly, uh, there's not much of a campaign there. Uh, and I suspect he's probably hol holding back, waiting for Horn to just explode. And do you think she would be able, Rodolini would be able to pick off enough Republican votes out there to beat an unknown like Brnovich, who we will know more about should he get out of the primary. I think, I think so. She's, she's very popular. She's very well liked. And there's still that bad taste left from four years ago 
where she got clobbered, and that's all coming back out again now because of the horn missteps. It's an important theme that, that is going on here. With all the top executive offices, save for the superintendent of public instruction, right? Democrats have one candidate, no primary. Republicans have primaries that are sure to be nasty and, and, and not pretty. And, you know, there's a lot of chatter about the Duval, Goddard, Rodolini, one, two, three on the Democratic side. Those are three great candidates. And if you've got a united Democratic Party backing some seriously good candidates, Republicans have got to watch out. Or they're, they might find themselves on the wrong side. Is that Secretary of State race Goddard's to lose? Yeah, I think so. Uh, he, he is so well known. Uh, and, and his positives are up where they ought to be that, you know, if he runs a decent campaign, he's there. Yeah, there, there, there are three Republicans running. Will right. Cardin, Justin Pierce, Representative Pierce, and Michelle Reagan, Senator Michelle Reagan. You know, I, I, I'm just picking out of thin air, but if your name is Reagan and you, you are a woman and you have a great reputation like Senator Reagan does, that put, makes you pretty formidable. But she has to get through a primary with two other very good candidates, right. uh, both of whom uh, uh, would make great secretaries of state. So. I, I don't know who Terry Goddard wants to run against, but I bet it's not Michelle Reagan. Interesting. All right, uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction. Again, will the incumbent get out of the primary? Yeah, I think he will. I, you know, the, I think there's a lot of focus on that race in very small circles. But if you get outside of the very small circles, very, very few people are focused on the, uh, the dramas that may be there. And Hoopenthal has never lost an election. He's got great name ID. He's done good things with the office. And so I, th I think he's going to do a lot better than people say. Well, what about David Garcia? I mean, can, can he pick off enough Republican votes? Is that going to be a race or is that, again, Hoopenthal's to lose? Well, I think in a way it's Hoopenthal's to lose because he's made some missteps uh, in, in effect and he's been labeled as the, you know, the superintendent of private instruction. Uh, and that's caused a, a, a significant constituency for public schools to get very up in arms and energized in a way that they haven't been in a very long time. All right, well, as far as the treasurer's race, again, lots of, Hugh Hallman seems to be the only name that anyone recognizes. In yeah, that Randy Pullen's running, and Pullen was the party chairman and uh, a decent fellow. Um, that, the funny part about that office is, is, it plays to my own personal biases. Republicans have held the treasurer's job in Arizona for almost every term since 1948. And the Republicans were the majority in the state until the late 80s, in other words, People trust the Republicans with the money, is, is, is my logic. And so I, it, it's going to be it's going to be a Republican that wins. I don't even know if there's a Democrat filed in the yeah, Treasury I don't think race. there is no oh, Democrat, is and, and It's to my point. I, it's not even worth running as a Democrat. But <laughs> to get out of a primary, you mentioned Randy Pollan. You've got a lot of connections. Pollan, you've got a lot of connections True. there. Um, can Hallman get out yeah, of that primary? I, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing like everybody else. I think he probably can. He's got more name ID straight up. Now, Pullen might spend more money and, and change that dynamic. But there's a lot of randomness to this thing as voters go down the ballot. And, yes. and we'll see. CD1, how strong is Ann Kirkpatrick? She's very strong uh, and has been working the grassroots like in a way that people don't see. I mean, that the, the, especially with congressional races, uh, the constituency work, the going around from town to town, doing it consistently every weekend, uh, that's something that doesn't show up. And that's what she's been doing. She's been working hard. It's another circumstance, Ted, where Republicans are going to have a nasty primary, are having a nasty primary, Indeed. and Democrats are united and are coasting. And so it, we'll, we'll see. I think Speaker Tobin is likely to be the nominee for the Republicans. And he's having a fundraiser this week with Mitt Romney uh, leading the event. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to have the resources. What Ann, uh, who's a great congresswoman in her own right, but what she's vulnerable on is that this is a non-presidential year. The Republicans turn out in higher percentages than Democrats, and she's really got to hold every single Democrat and cut into the Republican base in order to hold that thing. I don't know if she will. Uh, last time we had discussions regarding Congressional District 9, the consensus was that Kirsten Sinema might as well start campaigning now because they're going to be coming after her right and left, and she's going to have a real bad... She seems relatively secure in this race. Well, it's because they're coming at her right and right, not right and left. Uh, and... Uh, they're, they're beating her up already. I don't see any movement. Uh, she's, she's holding strong, and she's doing everything right. What do you think? It, it, I think it's, 
Have you sensed the theme? Uh, the Republicans are going to have another nasty primary here, be divided. It hurts their fundraising. It hurts their messaging. They both have to play to the right because they, they want to win the right. And they can't play in the center where cinema wins that election. Well, then let's get to what could be a Democratic nasty race, and that's CD7. Mary Rose Wilcox, Ruben Gallego, what, what goes on there? Is that the old guard versus the new guard? That is, that is old versus new, but it's also much more, uh, there's much more strata in it. You know, there's, there's four or five candidates that have filed. Actually, you're right. And, and, and yeah. I think all of them in with a vowel. I think they're all Hispanic. I think they all lay claim. One of them is named Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez, yeah, I was going to say. They all lay claim to that mantra. Only one has Ed Pastor's endorsement, and that's Mary Rose Wilcox. Ruben Gallego is a hustling, hardworking guy is going to raise a lot of money, but the, the others are going to cut in. And so I, no one really knows how that's going to play What do you think is going to happen over there? Right now, uh, Ruben's got the ground game going for him, uh, much more so than anybody I think understands. Uh, he's got uh, uh, his folks going door to door, but not carrying paper. They're, they've got little Palm Pilot type type thing. Boy, that dated me. Yeah, I was going to say, iPhones. what's that? It's 1993, yeah. they're, I think. They're doing iPhones. Okay. Uh, and uh, having the, uh, the voter file on it. So when they go door to door, they're ticking off who they talk to, what, what kind of response they've gotten. I mean, it's high tech like nobody's ever seen before. All right, before we get you guys out of here, very quickly, will the state legislature change noticeably? Uh, R &D. No, it'll be it'll be R and R in both chambers, and the personalities will shift. What do you think? Uh, pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. All right, guys, uh, we look forward to speaking with you some more as the season progresses. Good to have you both there. Yeah, a pleasure. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at a Mesa woman who has figured out a way to take her love of words and create custom art pieces out of concrete. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Ed Kishel have the story. Block by block, Yolanda Esquer has turned a simple home project into a flourishing business. Initially, when I started, I made a block with our last name on it. And I took it to a photo shoot and the photographer really liked it. And she said, you know, you ought to make these and sell them. And it just kind of, it's one of those things, you know, when you're talking to someone, it just kind of, just kind of sit on the back of my head. But it got Yolanda thinking. And several years later, she took the plunge and started Tuvlo. The materials I use are pretty basic. Water, mortar, and yeah. cement. I take that and then I pour it into, or I hand pour it into the mold and I smooth out the, the top of it. Um, I'll spray water on it if I need it to get a little bit shinier, and then I go ahead and, and um, use whatever I'm going to, you know, stamp into the concrete. And it's never gonna be the same because, you know, I obviously do it one at a time. And so the finishes and the textures and even the colors, even though it's always gray, is always gonna vary depending on the temperature outside or if I put too much water or too much cement or too much mortar or not enough mortar, not enough cement, not enough water. So it's always different, it's never the same. Working with concrete in Arizona does present some challenges. I have to work very quickly um, in the sense that in Arizona, especially during the summer, uh, the concrete cures very quickly. Whereas it, it's the winter time, you know, I have a couple of hours or somebody says, oh, wait, that doesn't look right. Or even if I don't like it, I can go back and start all over again. Once the concrete is in the mold, Yolanda uses her stamps to create names, words, even quotes. Pretty much anything a client can dream up, Yolanda can do. I really get a kick out of people when they walk up and you could just see their brain just going, wow, I can do this or I can do that. Or wait a minute, what could, you know, what word do I want to do? Words have always held a special place in Yolanda's heart. A voracious reader since childhood, when it came time to name her business, she drew upon that passion. Well, I have a great love of words and language. And so when I was trying to think of a name for the company, uh, I looked around like different languages and Greek um, is what I ended up with. So the word tuvlo, T-O-U-V-L-O, um, in the Greek means brick. And while Yolanda is proud she is making a living with her blocks, there's something else that fuels her, a piece of advice we can all learn from. Not so much for 
you know, the money or, oh, you know, to be someone that's known. I think it's just, it's very simple to me. And I don't even think of myself as an artist. I think of myself as just somebody who likes to do what I do. And those blocks can be found at the Gilbert Farmers Market. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.